evening. I am Teresa Marie Ketter, curator of the Voices Women Artists in the Era of Second Wave Feminism Exhibition and Registrar and Collection Specialist at the Beach Museum of Art. I would like to start with a land acknowledgement written by the K-State Indigenous Faculty and Staff Alliance. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrell Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Perry Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Welcome to our event this evening, Connecting to Feminism, Women Artists at K-State. This program is coordinated with the women artists in the era of second wave feminism at the Beach Museum of Art. Though we are unfortunately closed until hopefully next month, the exhibition can be viewed virtually online at mkbma.org, which includes a 3D tour of the gallery. Once we reopen, the exhibition will be up through the end of 2023. I organized this event with hopes to connect the women artists in the 1970s, which the exhibition focuses on, with working artists in the community. When I proposed the idea of the exhibition, I had no way of knowing the parallels that would arise between the present and the 70s era of the artworks. Last summer, we saw the landmark 1973 Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade overturned. Women no longer have the right at the federal level to bodily autonomy. Then in reaction to the new decision, Congress tried and failed to pass a bill echoing the failed Equal Rights Amendment. Both these reflect cornerstones in the feminist movement of the past. Our lives are affected by the social changes brought about by the women of the past. Tonight, we have five internationally known women artists, three of whom are teaching currently at the Department of Art here at K-State University, with Murphy Picaste, Nancy Morrow, and Dr. Rebecca Hackerman. Two have somewhat recently retired from the department, Geraldine Craig and Teresa Tempero Schmidt. All are working artists. Now, I will hand off the presentation to the artists to introduce themselves and their work. Further, as we talk a little bit about how the social movement of feminism affected themselves and their careers. Then we will have a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. During the presentations, we will address these after the individual presentations as time allows. Thank you. Hello, I am Teresa Tempero Schmidt, and I'm an artist uh, first, and I was a professor at Kansas State University. And there I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've been teaching at Kansas State University from 1972 through 2020. And I just retired a couple of years ago. And um, I've been doing art since then, working with my gallery in Omaha, Nebraska, Modern Arts Midtown, and uh, doing the work at home in living with my family. I have a member, one, one member of my family here, and she's an invalid, and we live together here in Manhattan, Kansas. I, um, I started out very much strong in the feminist movement many years ago. I felt um, that there hadn't been the equal treatment of women at that time, and I think many reasons for that have become more visible to me and I'm seeing more and more um, equal treatment of women now uh, but uh, certainly not with this Roe versus Wade problem. Uh, I would like to say that at the time I was a student there were no women faculty. Um, all the professors that I studied with were men and I appreciated them also. Um, I can remember thinking to myself how indoctrinated I was with the idea that women were second class. When in walked a professor to teach me printmaking and it was a woman and I thought, oh no, 
anyway, this was one of the things that I became aware of later, thinking to myself, how could have I felt that way? But I did. Um, as I was a student in college, I ran across other forms of discrimination. Um, but again, I'm not trying to place blame so much as feeling like it's partially roles people feel they must fulfill. And I think um, more and more as I get older, and I'm quite a bit older, um, I'm seeing the relationships that people have um, as quite normal and natural. And um, I think men and women are more like one another than they realize. Um, as a student, I like to work with drawing. And I'd like to say, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. And I did drawings, portraits. This is a portrait of a friend of mine who was a roommate for a time, a Greek woman, and one that was very interested, interesting and, and uh, spoke seven languages. And I find people to be the most exciting um, thing in my life, people, and also places, of course, but mostly people and landscapes. Um, so that's the thing that I did the most. I drew first with pencil, next. And you can see here, I learned how to use pencil with erasers. Um, I would draw and redraw, and I was very much influenced by Toulouse-Lautrec. I was very much inf influenced by uh, Katie Kolowitz. Uh, I was influenced by the, the natural, the heartfelt, soulful quality of Alice Neal. Um, not so much the slickness uh, and the control of rendering, but more the heartfelt soulfulness of the artist. Next. I worked also with students, and this is a, a very large litho that was printed in Seattle, Washington at Stone Press Gallery. And they, uh, if you look on the left-hand side of the print, um, you'll see the high heels there. This young woman was told uh, that she couldn't do art because it would be against her religion. She was also a gay student and was kept from being herself. She was not allowed to be who she was. And she quit art. And she was, in fact, the best student I've ever had. And I was very unhappy that that particular uh, incident took place. But as I've heard since then, she's back to doing her own work. And she's been in touch. And I'm so grateful to hear that. Next. This is uh, finally moving away from just black and white. This is a portrait of my late husband, who passed on from Parkinson's disease about three years ago. And this is Larry Schmidt. And he was a painter. And again, the human side is very important to me. The qualities that each of us have and share can be felt, I think, in a good work of art. And I think um, it's more important to me the compassion that each of the pieces portrays uh, that extends beyond just the individual portrait. Uh, the look, the qualities of physical are not what I'm trying to capture. And because of that, I moved on to more abstraction. Next. Uh, this particular piece is called Sanctuary. And the idea that we're safe inside or inside the spirit that, that you know we all know is a higher being. And I feel um, two umbrellas that were on the floor one day, my cats were playing with it and I saw them as a containment. And, as a, a safety place. So I did the drawing, it's graphite. These are very large drawings. These are two, three by four foot and four by four foot. Next. This is a smaller drawing. This is a mixed media drawing that the Beach Museum has. It's called Land and Sea. And again, it's trying to use media differently and also 
seeing the individuality of each part, and at the same time, the whole wholeness, the connectedness, the unifying of the parts. Next. This is the gallery, Modern Arts Midtown, and it's in, on Dodge Street, just down the hill from the Jocelyn Art Museum. It's a very, very huge, huge gallery, and I love the containment. I love the director there. He is a wonderful, wonderful artist himself, Larry Roots. Next. And you can see the the large, uh, these are four by four foot, it's a triptych. Um, and again, it's my attempt to work with color and it's a little too separate, I think, and it's a little too, and of course I'm very critical, but it seemed to sell right away. Next. Um, since then, I feel a little better about this painting. It's again, um, meant to be land and sea. It's a landscape, it's also, if you look at it, you can see the bird beak and the eye and the crown. And it's really um, about land and sea and water. Next, it's acrylic. Again, these are large drawings. This is more drawerly. And I love mushy brush, the sense of abstract expressionism. I love the movement of marks and having them become visible with the paint is interesting to me because it, it glorifies the importance of gesture and paint along with the linear aspect, um, which is much less. I, I really like the less color. Next. This one has a little more color. I didn't think it was successful. There, it seemed to be uh, popular and sold right away. Um, again, it's um, the artist, I'm trying to remember his name, um, Bruegel, um, the younger, was so influential in this piece because of the groups of people who were doing dancing and, and having frolicking in the woods. And, and I was trying very hard to think in terms of the color that, that Bruegel uses. I'm always looking at color from other works of art to learn. And I'm so grateful for uh, men and women's paintings, and especially more recently, women's paintings. And um, some of the ones that I've written down here that I'm so impressed with, uh, Cecily Brown, uh, Deborah Dancy, Deborah Dancy taught me so much by looking at her work. Um, she was a major professor of Aaron Wersma, one of our faculty at K-State. And I've learned so much from her and from um, so many others, Barbara Kroll, um, Jennifer uh, Pochinski. Um, of course, I, I loved Jenny Seville, her figure drawings. Um, the abstraction of Cy Twomling, a male, who um, has really made um, primitive imagery in the way of mark making so valuable and so exciting. Next. And this is a very recent piece, this one. And I think one more, if you want to go ahead. Next. And these two, these two are the last two pieces I've done. And that was just a few weeks ago that I finished them and took them up to the gallery in Omaha. And they're organic. Organic imagery has always been my favorite, but I try to work geometrically with compositions. And uh, that's been my most exciting challenge recently is really with composition, a balance, a unification, but it, uh, allowing for the individuality of parts. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm so grateful to the Beach Museum and to Teresa Ketterer, Ketterer and Jennifer um, for their wonderful support and help. Thank you so much. All right, hello. I hope 
everybody can hear me, okay. So I'm Mervy Vikastev, and um, I work at the, as an associate professor in, at the art department, and I teach graphic design. So I might be a slightly odd duck for this panel in the way that um, I'm both designer and um, artist, but um, I'm also from Finland originally. So my background is very different than people who grew up in the US. Um, thus my whole experience with feminism, I think would has been significantly different than what it is here. Um, I guess, let's show the first slide. If we can switch to that. So I'm showing kind of some old work and then what I do now, this is close to 11 years old right now, I think if not 12. Um, so this is a piece from a series of help that I made uh, just using letter breath. And um, I was interested at the time on calling attention to things that bothered me in the world, I guess. So, and you can switch to the other one too. This one was about um, uh, children and how often children die because of um, bad circumstances or abuse and so on and so on. So I made these. So, and this was at the time when I, have, I was just learning how to do letterpress too. I was exposed to that in oh, early 2000 something 2005 something like that um and i was trying to learn how to use this new medium at the time as as well as trying to call attention to things that were important to me uh and that i felt very strongly about at the time uh you can swap um to the last one on these so this was another another piece i made at the time where um but just titled till death to us part that was just calling attention to um violence against women um, and then if we switch to the next one, so this is where I think my background comes to play a little bit more as being a Finn. Um, i am always been kind of weirded out with the popular culture in America because the obsession of how uh, women supposed to look and what women are supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be behaving is somewhat different um, than where I grew up. So uh, at this time, this was in 2009 when I made these. I, again, I, I was still learning how to do letterpress at the time. And I was fascinated with these tabloid headlines that were happening all around me at the time. And clearly just a little old since Britney Spears is fighting with his dad, her dad and Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes are just you know, still together at this point. Um, but what I was doing is I was taking the current headlines from tabloids and putting them into this old medium. I created this Hollywood Times magazine framing for them and just wanted to kind of separate the imagery and the way media was portraying all these things at the time and just trying to focus on the kind of absurd nature that the media was, how media was selling all these ideas and these magazines and how they were just kind of portraying these things and making me question everybody else question, hopefully, like, is this really important? Is this really newsworthy? Is this what the news were originally meant for? Of course, yeah, that's a longer conversation. But um, anyway, so we can jump forward. So as a designer, I also, um, do just design work. So there's a lot of, a lot of my work is poster design, social poster um, design. So this was a poster I made about gender inequality and how it's not a laughing matter. Uh, can switch to the next, thanks. And this was a poster about loneliness, not really pertain pertaining specifically about women, but uh, just loneliness in general. So these are meant for a thematic poster design um, competitions where um, 
so what this that's what these works are for and then we can jump i think one more so this is more where i'm right now with my work so it i'm may more concentrated in the formal aspects of typography and also gotten more comfortable with letterpress and ex I'm exploring more and more uh, artist books and trying to figure out how to uh, combine kind of my three passions, which would be letterpress and design and typography and artist books and creating things by hand and also tying my skills working with the computer. So this book, for example, is laser cut in addition to hand bound and hand printed. So on the next one, and here's another sample of kind of where, where I'm, what I'm doing right now. And then there's one more, I guess. And yeah, this is from 2021. So it's one of my recent, more recent books. So that's kind of in a really quick nutshell about me and my work, and uh, I'll let it go on for the next one. I think this is Nancy. Hey, everybody. I'm Nancy Morrow, and I teach painting and drawing here at K State, and uh, I also direct our MFA program. Uh, feminism has impacted uh, the content of my work, the venues, access to venues to show my work, support for my work. Uh, it's provided collaboration with other women, other women artists, and but most importantly, it has instilled in me um, from really very, very early on the belief that I could do anything. So having been raised half in the 60s and half in the 70s, pretty much really, right, 50%, 50%. Um, I had a front row seat to some of the societal, legal, and financial changes that were happening um, that were brought about by the feminist you know, um, and the second generation, second wave feminist artists. Let's go ahead with the first slide. So in 2005, I was invited to join AIM Gallery in New York, um, which was founded in 1972 as the first nonprofit artist directed gallery for women artists in the US. AIR continues to support creative risk taking and open dialogue uh, by women and non binary artists. And so here you can see very early, this is 1972. Um, on Worcester Street. So they were first, uh, the gallery was first in Soho and has moved a number of times since. Um, go ahead with the next slide. There we go. There's a quote um, from Carrie Lovelace, Art in America in 2007. Since 1972, the trailblazing AIR gallery in New York has provided quiet support for those operating outside the art world's market obsessed precincts. There I am, you can see me on the far right side, <laughs> different, different hair. Um, and a quote from Susan B, one of the New York members um, and a recent Guggenheim uh, recipient. Uh, she says, it has been a good experience for me to be part of a community of artists, which is active uh, site of cultural and social resistance. Change please. And on the right, there we are now. Um, when I was invited to the gallery, we were in Chelsea and we've been in Dumbo down under the bridge um, in Brooklyn since about well, maybe 2008, 2009. Um, now we're on Plymouth Street. So on the left there, oops, go back, please. Thanks. <laughs> the 1995, so I took a little time off between undergrad and graduate school and was um, finishing up in 1991, 1995, the Guerrilla Girls were active. And that's the environment that I, you know, pretty much came out of grad school in, um, where women artists in New York were, you know, tackling some of these inequities, inequities in, the, in the art world and, and the representation of women's art was really lacking. Um, next slide. There we go. The gallery um, 
provides lots of opportunities, you know, um, in terms of collaborations and projects. This is a, a exhibition that we did in India as part of the Kochi Musiris uh, uh, Biennial in Cochin. And this is 2016. So we did a show and we um, put together a, an international panel and um, I did an artist talk. So that was a great experience. Next. And uh, we took over a house on Governor's Island in New York. This is also 2016. Um, a little bit, it reminded me a little bit of Woman House, the Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro project um, that inspired me um, early on. Uh, of course, and, and we didn't, this was an installation um, based as much as just a great venue to show work. A little bit, of, a little bit of both maybe. Next. So I'm going way back in, in time here <laughs> to just ground, you know, where I've come from. And this is 42 years, 42 jobs. The first, this is number one through 20. And this is it, so 2003, I was 42, and I, I stopped counting the number of jobs I had at 42, and that was the year that I joined the faculty at K-State. And up until that time, I'd done just a lot of temp kind of work and, you know, temporary and service industry, um, a lot of office works. I worked in libraries. I taught swim lessons. I um, put numbers on the back of Little League uniforms. <laughs> I did. I was a telemarketer for one day. Um, that really didn't go well. <laughs> and I was teaching, you know, a lot of these temporary adjunct positions, including one in the Women's State Prison um, near Big Harbor. Um, next. I learned to separate radium and polonium. A little shout out to Marie Curie and all the brilliant women scientists and intellectuals um, that there have been. Next. This one's entitled Suck in 2011. And it was really about the limitations for women. And I just envisioned, you know, women from their cubicles being sucked up to the glass ceiling and just held there in place, not being able to, you know, move through that. Um, so a lot of my work in those days, and, and that was around the time that I was first in the gallery, you know, a lot of the work had to do with power imbalance, scripted roles, uh, and stereotypical expectations of men and women, sexual double standards, um, economic disparity, and the lower paying temporary nature of a, a lot of jobs that women end up doing. Next. This is this is a work that's in the beach collection. Um, it's called Almost Cured from 2010. And you can see there I am coming home, <laughs> my briefcase and um, a little cured ham. And I think that's an empty beer can there <laughs> by the cooler. And life's pretty good, you know, but it it has to do with um, these questions of having it all, or if you have to, you know, if you want it all as a woman, then how do you balance career and, um, you know, family and, and take care of all those responsibilities. Next. And then care and gendered care and being a, a caregiver. Women are the primary caregivers, or I, I should say they are more commonly the, the caregivers for family um, in this country, including paid and unpaid. So family, as well as the, the um, care industry and that, and I mean that for children as well as, um, you know, elderly or um, disabled. And I found myself in that position. Um, and this work, See Me, See You, See Me, had to do with that, um, you know, that responsibility of, of caring for someone else. And that blurred line between 
you know, myself and another person, questions of personhood, all of that. Um, and so not only, you know, thinking about women and that added role, which, which does affect um, the ability to advance in careers and, you know, so forth. Um, you know, it was just changing me at that time. Next. And so in care of um, a few years there, I had, uh, you know, a pretty big transformation in my work. And so just painting things that were around and, um, you know, turning them and envisioning new realities for them. So we have sock too. We have some sock monkeys on the left. And then those are Duplos, those giant enormous Lego things that I, I turned them on the side and it started to look sort of like a battleship, um, which seemed to kind of resonate with me at the time. Next. And then this came out. And so, you know, I just, I, after all of that experience, I decided to stop reflecting on, um, you know, the experience of watching someone decline neurologically, which had been the case. And I started wondering if I could learn anything from that degenerative process. You know, if there was, if, if there were to be any positive thing that could come out of that. And I wondered if there was a way to turn, you know, that imprinting um, process toward creative means. And it occurred to me that if I could somehow interrupt my own cognitive imprinting that it would free me up to uh, invent more freely. And so this is 2019. This is the work that I have in our faculty show that's currently up in Willard Hall. So I wanted to, of course, put a shout out for everyone to come over and see our show. Um, and this is old Edna. And old Edna was a steam locomotive um, in Blairmore, um, Alberta, or at least based on, on um, this, this locomotive that was used during coal mining years. And she was behind um, this fence. So there's the chain link fence as well. Um, next. Here are a few more. Um, when ice turns to wood and a three antler deer and so I find myself now, you know, becoming more interested in, in caretaking for the environment, um, or at least, you know, that is dialogue within the, the group of artists in our gallery. And of course, a really important, timely um, topic for all of us. Next. And I, this is the last, um, work I'm going to show. I am still continuing to do projects with the gallery um, collaborations. And this was a folio that um, I think about 46 of us put together, all, all drawings. And it was part of the um, extraction, Art at the Edge of the Abyss, um, international multimedia, multi-venue um, project that um, took place two years ago. And uh, we all made a drawing for it and um, based on, mine was based on the two-headed trout that have been seen in the Snake River near where I grew up um, and coincidentally near a phosphate um, mine. And so um, there's my drawing of two-headed fish. And this, um, this project is now in the Nevada Museum of Arts uh, Center for Art and Environment. Um, they're, permanent archive collection. So that was a nice, a nice home for it. And that's what I have. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. My name is Rebecca Hackerman and I'm an artist, scholar and professor in photography and art here at K-State. 
We are all also working artists. I use many media in my work, including steel interactive public artworks, stereo photography and drawing. I have a long career in the arts, both before I got to K-State at age 41, 10 years ago and now. I lived in San Francisco, London, New York, Minnesota, Fargo and Iowa. If you're watching this recording, it means that I um, was not able to attend because of a celebration at the provost's office to celebrate my promotion to a full professor, something I worked very hard for against all odds. And so I deeply apologize if you are watching this and I'm not able to be there in person. When I first encountered feminism in college in London in the late 1980s and early 1990s, I became aware of the way my looks, at the time great looks, made my life more difficult in the big city of London, where men would whistle and randomly approach me. No one could see past the apparent great look I was told I had, which did not always match how I felt on the inside. I hated any kind of attention of this way and felt very uncomfortable being looked at so much. It led me to cut my hair very short and wear boy clothes. It is important to note here for a younger audience that being a feminist does not mean one has to burn bras and march, although one could still do that. Rather, it means standing one's ground, being a woman, being successful, being courageous in the face of adversity, and simply, simply having that awareness of how one is perceived differently as a woman. I'm going to go over some of my work, but also interweave this talk with um, influences from different women in my life. This is my book that just came out, endorsed by Jonathan Crary by University of Chicago Press. As a successful woman with a business art, a busy art career, as a divorced woman, and a non-religious foreigner in this country, I also can say that being aware of this can help you cope with what one has to face. People have said to me, do people really call you professor? What is your student ID? <laughs> do re people really call you doctor? Um, they have also said, I am so sorry about your divorce when it was in fact one of the many joyful moments for me having been in a bad relationship. So there are some perceptions that others place on you that are just not true and the thing to do that is feminist is to totally ignore them and live your life in an authentic and happy honest way. Be the change that you want to see and support other women and other artists or people in your field, whatever your field is. I've been making stereoscopic hyper-real photographs that exist in a fictional space for decades. Many interrogate everyday situations and include jokes, puns, but are also feminist in many ways, some with and some without text. This is an interactive different work where the public looks inside and turns the crank to bring a new 3D image into view that is site specific and that it shows images that relate directly to the site. This iteration of the visionary sightseeing binoculars was adopted to become a memorial to a torn down bridge demolished in 2021. The city commissioned the memorial through the local historical society because of much community unrest regarding the destruction of said bridge. In these projects, I'm able to create 3D stereoscopic images from 2D historical ones using depth maps and software. The binocular is sighted at the viewpoint of the village, so in many ways it shows the past and is a sort of time machine. The project was also required at the very, as the very first sculpture ever bought by the Springfield Art Museum in 2021, and the first outdoor permanent work by a woman in their collection. In each iteration, obviously, the images change. My first feminist theoretical frameworks came from my professors. We had three years of heavy theory and practice. There's no core in the UK and you study one subject. And in my case, that was photography, video and film. In high school, around 1988, had, I had also read Scream Quietly or the Neighbours Will Hear, a book on domestic violence in the East End of London that had a great impact on me. 
In college in central London, I was fortunate enough to have Laura Mulvey, who wrote the famous essay on the gays as a visiting artist scholar and Stuart Hall as regular professor. The Beauty Myth is a more accessible popular book and it argued that even if we had equal pay, women are more disadvantaged because they have to buy clothing and makeup. I also read Ms. Magazine, which at the time had incredible articles on feminism worldwide that often shocked me. The first American I met was Abigail Solomon Godot. And as a professional woman, she was very different than anyone else I had ever met. And I was grateful that she mentored my path to America. Later, after my MFA, in New York, my advisor was Yvonne Rayner, and we were treated to visiting artists like Jenny Holzer, whose ranting essay in the Beach exhibition is a wonderful piece of work that I hope I can see in person. And in many ways, parts of it run true to how I feel today. In the Whitney program, of which I was a fellow in 2000 and 2001, we were treated to seminars on the object pretty art, the thing we wish for that can never uh, that we can never have that drives us by Mary Kelly, who is a very well known feminist artist and writer who teaches Lacanian and feminist theory at UCLA. I hope to help create a supportive environment of goodwill wherever I am, and I try to ignore the people who are resentful and jealous, especially if one is successful. Here are some works and closing thoughts for this panel. Um, this is an older work shown here inside white stereoscopes and it is entitled the society of the spectacle and refers to the famous book by guy dubor written in the 1960s yet i find it to be very relevant today regarding social media the image is shown inside a stereoscope and shows a hollow head figure gesturing towards a screen in 3d and there is no brain only a stump this part of it is more apparent in its stereoscopic 3d version in this work, her she hands, the work alludes to putting one's face on or putting one's hands on as if one shops for them in the morning every day. Um, and it sort of talks about how we even prepare our hands for the world by going to the nail salon. This one is titled The Wars and it depicts a male who has a target on his head. Three, in 3D, the arrows point to certain regions of his body. By titling it The Wars, the piece alludes to the question, would women start as many wars as men? The text reads, it all started here. Lastly, I would like to say that I'm included in this book by the well-known feminist collective, femalephotographers.org, or Femex of Berlin. We pledge to help each other and create exhibitions and publications since most of the art world locations still feature only men, although this is slowly changing. My mentor, Katarina Bossa, has helped me greatly in this area. As Madeleine Albright said, there is a special place in hell for women who do not help other women. It is important for all young artists out there that you are not jealous of other artists, but that you see yourself um, to all be in the same boat and have goodwill surround yourself with successful people because you can learn from them always and um to the women out there please bear in mind that when you write a recommendation for another woman you need to know that there might be several men ready to pounce on any hint of a negative sentence in your recommendation they may over inflate it so when you do write for a woman the playing field is maybe not so equal so be ultra positive. Don't give anyone a chance to put her down because they might be looking for a way to do that. Hello, I'm Geraldine Craig. Um, as Teresa said, I retired in um, well, actually just May of 2022. So I haven't been out very long. I really do miss everyone very much. Um, but I wanted to thank the Beach Museum and my fellow panelists for this great opportunity to hear about feminism from all of their perspectives. So um, 
if we want to jump into the images, my very mixed media practice is best understood through the lens of textiles as a deliberate feminist choice to elevate women's work and women's lives, whether working with umbrella artists on a residency in Thailand or honoring the food crafted by Moroccan women chefs while on a residency there, transforming the daily newspaper into a bodily record of pleasure, consumption, and gratitude. Fortunately, when I was in college, the craft movement was exploding, while the pattern and decoration movement poked at Clement Greenberg's premise that decoration wasn't sophisticated. My post-college work, a series comprised of silk-screened EKGs on stitched and applied discarded dyed tablecloths, were eco-feminist emotive maps of the heart that sought understanding of the textual complexity of becoming a new mother. My superhero and best studio assistant ever, and I left for graduate school, where my feminism was confronted with the idea that mothers aren't serious artists, that motherhood is too traditional. And even as I was getting divorced and became the primary income for our household. But I found a discharge method that could help me find the light in darkness, light revealed in the cloth, and this resist stitching method to suggest an ancient text. The idea of imagination in the body before words are formed, an emergent language, uh, or thought of also people who aren't being heard, has become a touchstone that has continued in my work. I returned to feminist text, in particular Rosika Parker's The Subversive Stitch, with her idea of a stitch as angry piercing and a deceptively simple act of catharsis. I found stitching to be cathartic and certainly acknowledge its universal symbol and its physical reality of a structure that holds everything together. But I also thought of stitching as a haptic kind of language. I reveled in cloth as a second skin and the role as it plays for inherent repository for memory. In those works you just saw from my from the uh, late 80s, I mapped a psychology of mobility for women to carry one's home anywhere, including the abandoned Detroit buildings. But going to Detroit post MFA, I was thrilled with new material inspiration and equally inspired by the faith that required to live in the city proper, especially for African American mothers. I embraced new materials to juxtapose with cloth, choosing binaries of birth, death, hard, soft, masculine, feminine. I created silk pockets for discarded objects my son and I found on the street. Materials became a series of heroic scale rosaries, room size installations when artist grants supported those kinds of ambitions or wall mounted sculptures. I experimented with binaries of nature, culture, a wire wrapped pair nestled in the negative space of a sweet street sweeping brush of industry or new analog digital binaries, scratching a pelvis butterfly and chrysalis drawings into an image of a historic glass domed birdhouse. I experimented with hand burning emergent language in cloth and wood and printing photographic images on sheer silk to create three dimensional double exposures. Books, screens and scrolls were a preferred format as they implied the unfolding of narrative time within the forms. With my move to Kansas and K-State in 2007 and a new environmental vocabulary, discarded sewing patterns became a promising domestic new lowbrow material for me full of found text and women's work implications that could be layered into metaphoric skins to retain their artifact character even in shallow depth. Sewing also linked me to my recently deceased mother who had taught me gathering patterns from community members became an important concept for holding their collective maker spirit and new works beyond myself in works such as the KU Medical School Commission Pulse I created with Nelson Smith. The potential for cloth to serve as historical record, such as Bayou Tapestry from 1066, led me to a wellness project for veterans to express and preserve their stories in a community art scroll. The art workshops and exhibitions stopped in 2020 with COVID, so I started to create small works that use digital printing of burned images with embroidered texts taken from historic wartime letters to and from home. As a feminist, my work is grounded in transforming the textual complexity of lived experience, such as Thai women wrapping temple cloth around old growth teak trees to save them from the saw. I hope that you can hear their voices through me. Thank you.
Okay, with that, I'll have the presenters come back online and we'll start our Q&A portion. We do have one question in our Q&A box. Uh, viewers, please feel free to go ahead and submit as well. Um, our first question, I think, is directed at Murphy. What are some similarities and contrast in Finland with women's suffrage and right and women's rights over their own bodies? Here, I'm unmuted. Muted. I hope now. Okay. Um. Okay. So that's a big question. Uh. Well. Finland is, I guess, very different. It's one of the, I grew up in a very, very equal setting. I never once doubted that women couldn't do what guys didn't do. I think the only thing women couldn't do was they couldn't be a priest or be in a military when I was growing up. Other than that, there wasn't anything women couldn't do. But and now they can also join military nowadays if they want to, and they can also be priests. I was married by a female priest, so my kids were baptized by a female priest. But regardless of that, so uh, as far as rights of women's own bodies, we have full autonomy. If one, if this is abortion related, I guess women can have an abortion if they so choose to. And uh, when I was in school, if you wanted to have condoms, you could walk to the school nurse and they would give you condoms and you could go to a nurse and get birth control pills which the government subsidized and gave you for free for a year and after that you'd have to pay but they're not super expensive but you didn't have to have a parental permission you could just do it um, uh, as far as voting rights if I think we were the second country in the world that gave women the right to vote I'm not sure on the exact year, but way before I was born. <laughs> so, um, like, I've never questioned that women couldn't have a right to vote or couldn't have a say on political matters in the country. Or, in general, I, I just never doubted that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Uh, schooling is extremely competitive uh, as far as if you want to go to university, it's free. Um, if we go into the social side of things, um, school, school is free regardless up till 12th grade. Um, but then um, if you want to go to university, then you have to apply. There's no tuition, but there is exams that you have to take and only X amount of people get to go in. Um, so, I mean, I can go on that about, you know, further, but um, so I'm, I guess with that answer, my choice, is this how is feminism influenced my choices of media? Is that for me or everybody? Uh, I think that one's for everyone. Okay. So I'll let somebody else take over so I don't just keep talking. See. Terry, would you like to start out on this question? Uh, I don't have a video. I mean, I'm not on the screen. Give me a second. For some reason. Well, we can hear you. We can still talk. We can hear you. Okay. Well, um, I just want to say how much I've appreciated hearing all of this. I've known all of you for so long, and yet... Um, I don't, you know, oh, there we are. Um, and yet I haven't seen the, the intimate information so closely. And this is wonderful. Um, I'm amazed at the accomplishments of all of you. Um, Jerry, I just, I'm so impressed with the quality of your work. It just, it, it just thrills me. Uh, not only, conceptually but physically it's it has that every mark and every connection is just so absolutely wonderful and uh it it makes when you say threads and the the moving of the lines 
with that. It just connects so well. Uh, and uh, Nancy, I'm, I can't believe how much you've accomplished and how wonderful the work is. Uh, I love your latest work. I haven't seen it and I'm shocked at the, not shocked really, I've always liked your work, but the watercolors um, are amazing to me. And uh, the drawings express so much of the, uh, the quality of uh, feminism to me. Um, the use of um, Betty Boopish looking <laughs> imagery just have, has always been fascinating to me. So Terry, can you talk a little bit about when you started out as an artist, what material you wanted um, to use? I was very much interested in sculpture. And like Jerry, and like, you know, Mervy's uh, uh, sculptural uh, cuttings that, that she did, the last ones that really are so exciting. Um, I wanted to work in sculpture and I went to my junior college and I went in and I said, oh, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want sculpture. And they said, oh, well, you can't do that. Women are not allowed to do sculpture. And I said, oh, okay. It didn't occur to me that that was a problem because I was so excited about drawing and so excited about painting and, you know, sculpture uh, was, I couldn't do it. They weren't, we weren't allowed to. And it never occurred to me that it was a problem. Um, on my job interviews, um, I had trouble. Uh, I would go on an interview and then at the end of the interview, I'd be told it was a token and that I wasn't to get the job, but thanks anyway for coming. Um, in those days, um, I would attend college, and this was many, many years ago, there were no female teachers uh, in my art departments. So it was, you know, those were the ways of the times. Yes. Um, um, I still got along fine. Would anyone else like to say anything about their choice of medium being influenced by feminism? Okay, um, well, one question I had is, uh, what changes for women in the art industry have you seen over the years of your career? I think it's better, much better, except for Roe versus Wade. <laughs> Several, yeah. other things, several other things but I, I think it's become a little bit better but um, I meet curators who still say oh I just took stock of how many female artists we have in the collection and I realized only two percent are women <laughs> and so there's a long way to go and um, but one thing I've noticed change in education is that there are more female students. Um, photography is a very male dominated um, field and uh, there's more female professors and more female photographers now. And I think part of it is because because of phones, everyone thinks no one knows it's a profession. They don't think that you can even do it as a job. And so they so there's just like women who feel like it's fun, <laughs> but the men have a lot of pressure to make money and they may not go into it because they don't really even know that they can do it as a profession. Um, but in the art world, I don't know, we have a long way to go, but it's getting better slowly. Uh, Nancy, do you want to unmute? That would help, wouldn't it? I was going to say, and I've been hiding out in an all-women gallery. You know, so I, my sense is that it's better, but I, yeah, I'm, ex I've excused myself a little bit from all of it. And I think part of it is uh, seeing what opportunities your students have that you may not have. Yeah, yeah, that is something. I mean, I think in terms of content, you know, that, and I had all male um, painting professors in upper division anyway that I had a, a couple women um, instructors at the foundation level the beginning classes um, but content was definitely um, you know there were there were things that you shouldn't make work about you know because they were deemed a little bit too sentimental 
like family or relationships, anything like that, you know, and um, thinking about media choices too, I, I would say, you know, working on paper um, came about like the, the self permission for me to work on paper instead of canvas or wood, you know, um, that, that came out of um, exposure to more women artists, the people like Nancy Spiro, you know, so forth. So. I think that I think men are still making the big, big work, like the size wise in general. I know there's some women who do too, but in general, the big works are still made by men. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the training and part of my training too, you know, that you make it big and you make it tough and, you know, and, and I worked in a really heavily, you know, the paint was thick and it was heavy aesthetically and it was tough and you know and all of that um yeah bigger was better for sure <laughs> yeah i was just going to add too that it feels like um like all you know systems until there's more representation um, by women then it becomes a catch-22 because people don't see themselves um and see it as you know a, a possible kind of way to exist as an artist. And then there's also so many things that just aren't really understood. Um, and uh, so to use the uh, comedians, um, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler were being interviewed. And um, Tina said that the early days having Amy there in the writer's room in SNL was so critical because she could make a joke <laughs> about or tampon or something and Amy would be dying and the men didn't understand it and they're like why is that even funny <laughs> um but they said you know so then we had to take the time to explain why it was funny <laughs> um, but it's true that there's still I think a lot that isn't necessarily understood and so just better representation um will help then fuel I think more women being um represented in a, that kind of cycle that doesn't get broken until you, I hope that made sense. Mm -hmm. I, I was gonna say, am I almost, no. You're okay. Okay, so kind of piggybacking off what Rebecca said about the education um, or the representation. I personally have always had female professors in design. Um, so I never felt like there was a threshold that I couldn't do. It was from my undergrad, but of course I'm younger. Um, so that was never an issue as far as me personally, but I have in the last 20 years seen the shift in designers going from a lot more. When, when I started teaching, there was tons more guys than there were girls and now we're almost completely flipped. We can be 80% female in the classroom and this few guys. Um, how that trickles into the workforce, I don't know. I think some women end up dropping out once they stop making families, which is, of course, their choices. But I think people do get employed pretty e evenly, equally. I don't even though we're we've gotten to be a lot more female dominated as far as the graduation classes they tend to be hired like i can't see that they would be like only the guys would get jobs like like in today's industry i feel like the women are just as much employed as the guys are once it goes up the chain i'm not you know i, I can't you know but what's going to be 10 years down the road but i would say people that graduated from my classes 15 years ago, they're still thriving and having leadership positions. I have a lot of women who have their own companies now uh, or run their own businesses. Um, some are design related, some aren't, some have gone in their own offices, but regardless, I feel like there is a lot more. The younger generations have definitely taken more space than I think what it was in the 80s or 70s even. I know that in, um, I can share that in Germany, there are very few female photography professors. I have several friends who are 
photography professors there and they are the only women in their departments. One of my friends is trying to fight. They have a new hire, they have a new line open and um, they won't hire a woman. And she keeps trying to fight uh, to get a woman. And um, I, I'm another thing that comes to mind is that, you know, I'm also a drone pilot and I do uh, commercial work. There are hardly any female drone pilots out there. And certain types of photography is in the commercial world are still very male dominated because the public generally in terms of cameras, they just associate someone who really knows their stuff with a guy with muscles with all the gear and all the stuff on you know because it's so technical and so there there's definitely there's definitely still a long way to go in some areas it, it maybe in it, it, it's just these niche areas and um my friend who was in germany actually came to a conference a photography conference here and she couldn't believe how many female professors there were, even older ones, you know, who are about to retire. And she said, Rebecca, and she looked around, she's like, there's so many women. And she just, she just couldn't believe it. And, um, and so the, in different countries, it really is different by field. Um, so it's hard to tell. It's, there's good and bad things, I suppose, in each area. Yeah, in my curatorial statement, I had mentioned the women's sort of mediums and men's, and I got that from the Bauhaus in Germany because they divided the two uh, buildings in the first Bauhaus uh, by painters and sculptors for the men, and the women got, um, you know, more textile work and things like that. And um, perhaps, uh, Geraldine, you've, you're an artist that has taken some somewhat traditionally feminist medium with your um, influence of, you know, sewing and that textile charity. Uh, what do you think about, uh, I guess uh, you've, you've elevated it to your own means. Uh, what do you think, like, what do you think about that as your career, as you look back? Um, well, I think, um, Stitching and textiles are really having a moment in the art world right now. So <laughs> um, that's, you know, soft draped form like El Anatsui, even though he's using, you know, liquor foil um, pieces, there's just a lot of um, that out there. Um, I feel like probably um, choosing one <laughs> area and not quite so many different materials um, might be a better career <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know people like to be able to recognize your work with a certain style but um I felt like it was the only thing I really wanted to do I I started out in drawing and painting and then I found that I could transfer my drawings onto a silk screen and silk screen that onto fabric and then ah, yeah <laughs> there was just no going back I could I could then manipulate that soft pliable surface with you know my drawings or whatever and I also just fell in love with the color in a dye bath and how you could manipulate the um, the fabric into different patterns. And so um, I feel like people try to find themselves in a medium that they love, hopefully. And then that's what you do. One of my other questions I had written down for all of you is uh, for this goes for your students as well, for young people, especially young women entering the industry, what would you like to say to them? Well, I don't know. I mentioned it in my talk. I think the most important thing is that to stick together and help each other out because men do that all the time. Men get each other's shows, they help each other, and we need to do that actively. And um, you know, unfortunately, the art world is, if you are going in the art world, and other creative industries are very network based, there, there's not often um, an advert for a job. And so you have to network and be nice to everyone. <laughs> because if you're not nice to someone, someone will find out. And so supporting each other, go to each other's openings, invite each other to openings, and, um, and have informal critiques and meetings have mentors and people that you can talk to about um, your work 
it could be something technical, it could be something legal. Uh, you need to have really, really close friends that you can talk shop with. And then you have to have like other mentors who are maybe older who you sometimes contact for advice. But surround yourself with people and 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 also stay in touch with your professors. I cannot tell you how many times students just disappear. And I would willingly meet with them, and I always tell them this in my office to help them if they have to make a decision or and they they sort of get quite shy when they graduate. So it's okay to contact your professor and with advance notice book an appointment and speak to them. I, I assume, I don't want to speak for the others, but for me, that's fine. Or even giving advice on the phone. Yeah, I would, I would agree with the networking. Just don't try to do it alone. You know, develop, like build a community and the, your fellow student, you know, your, your classmates, stay in touch with them because they don't, they're not going to have an agenda. They're just going to be supportive. Hopefully they'll just be supportive. Um, and sometimes that's what you need. You need different kinds of, you know, people in your community. You need people that will give you critical feedback and you need people that will just support you and help you no matter whether your latest work is, is just something you shouldn't ever let out of your studio or not, you know, they'll just be there for you. I'm hearing, uh, don't, don't try to compete with your other students. They're just as much yes. for you as they Absolutely. are. <laughs> you yeah. them. You'll get farther if you're a share bear, right? <laughs> you will, you'll do better if you help others and they'll return that favor to you. I would also tell them to travel and Probably. to join associations for their profession. Your professors will know what they are and go to those meetings, even if you don't know what might happen. Because over time, you'll accidentally meet people, you'll chit chat, putting the chairs away. You know, you need to get out there and no one will knock on your door. You have to get out there and be in the field. Um, and I would, for most creative industries, say, move to a big city just for a little while because <laughs> there's more of them there and then you can come back to rural Kansas if you want but you know Make those connections <laughs> I'm not saying you can't stay in Manhattan but if there was ever a time to leave it would be when you're in your 20s you know so one of the things that I found really interesting as a change in the last oh let's say five to eight years is talking with my alumni who graduated 10, 12 years ago. And now that they're in their mid-career kind of path, they're in their mid-30s now, they uh, kind of glued me in in a way that what they're doing for network that didn't exist when we were in the school, when you know we were in our 20s, is having people in your field being mentors directly to you, even though you're not in the same place. So they're doing this via online resources. Uh, so there are these communities you can join online, depending on like for design, it works if you're in UX, UI, or if you're in you know web design, you have these own little pods of people who are interested in their own specialties. And there's a lot of people, both men and women who are willing to mentor um, younger people who are coming in and are fresh in the industry, even though you can't meet face to face, you can do all these things online now to answer questions or being reached out to and just share your knowledge. And there's all these Skillshare sites too that you can do it just to learn specific skill. But what was interesting to me that there is now, they're building these communities now online where people can totally starting out, you can try to get involved, just like Rebecca was saying earlier about getting involved in your, not just in your professional organizations, but also try to find your kind of communities and like-minded people online within your profession that can help you out if you have questions or if you run into kind of a question you can't solve or you need to troubleshoot things. So I, was th I thought that that was kind of a fantastic thing that has happened. Um, and has kind of broad generations of, at least in the designers, and I'm sure there's these own same kind of pods in fine arts too. Um, that again, it didn't exist because, you know, a lot of these things didn't exist when I was in their shoes, but 
So that's always cool. I would say too, just to always make time for it, you know, give yourself that permission, um, whether or not it's the primary source of income or any source of income, you know, and that can be, I think that can be a thing that's hard to justify for people. If it's not making money, then, you know, can you really devote the time to it? And I would just, you know, encourage, encourage young women, especially to find a way that they can stay involved with their art, you know, however larger or small it, it needs to be at the time just do something you know um creatively to to stay in touch with that that part of you um i would just also say that um i feel like a lot of what i would say to young women artists is the same thing i would say to young men um and that is uh like I think Rebecca said travel and see as much great art as you can, yes. you know, for your whole life, because you'll be inspired by it. Um, and also, then you'll have a better sense of what's out there. <laughs> um, so that's a career move. But, um, but I would say with a caveat that um, you should uh, make what you need to make in the studio, because it's the place where you're really free. It's the only place where you get to make every decision and, you know, bring your full self. And so if you do that, you might find an audience and hopefully you will. <laughs> um, but the caveat for women is just that, you know, it will be harder. It just will. Um, hopefully not for too much longer, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's just a matter of people really understanding and there's baked in bias and we all know that so and i'd like to add um one thing too it's it's really local um i've had several grad students contact me and talk freely about what they're doing how they've progressed um are they doing you know asking for advice and questions and so on and one of the things that occurred to me that really helped when i had children over to my studio and we all drew together. They wanted to bring their color crayon books. That's the first thing I told everyone, get rid of. If they have paper to draw on, that's not lint, no lines on it. It just has made such a huge difference. It made a difference for me when I was a kid, uh, I had to do my own pictures and I began to trust myself. And it makes such a difference for children not to have to stay in the line. <laughs> so uh, that was my advice to some of the kids that have graduated with their children. On the children thing, I um, would like to say perhaps that sometimes if you're in a creative rut, getting back into those materials you used when you were a child, like open up a fresh box of Crayolas and see where it takes you. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to add or like they'd, they'd like to say before we end this panel? All right, well, I'd like to thank all of our guests as well as the staff here at the beach for the opportunity to do this program tonight. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks to you, Teresa. I hope thank to you, see you. Thank you, thank you, Teresa and Jennifer. Thank you, Teresa. Bye everybody. Right, a good idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs>